it's called uh, rage farming. It's like raising a crop of rage and then farming it, converting it into cash, basically. But it, it's more than that. It's more than a commercial uh, proposition. Rage farming and defiance today are the, the evil twins that constitute the path to glory, fame, and riches. You want to be famous, you want to be rich, you need to provoke rage and you need to cultivate defiance. Ask any conspiracy theorist. I mean, anyone um, turned the cult leader. And I'm talking about disparate people, like, for example, Jordan Peterson and Donald Trump. They both thrive on rage. They both provoke rage. They both started with rage. Jordan Peterson started with rage against transgender people. And Donald Trump started with rage against anyone who is not white, <laughs> uh, which is a majority of humanity. Rage is also the engine that drives social media. And there is a confluence of malice, a confluence of malice between these kind of people, these wannabe cult leaders, wannabe um, conspiracy theorists, wannabe public intellectuals, and social media. Social media is a technology that enables these people. And social media is driven by rage. Ad sales, advertising sales on social media depend crucially on, on rage and negative affectivity, envy, relative positioning. And so naturally, the algorithms of social media, algorithm of YouTube, algorithm of Instagram, Facebook, and so on, they promote posts and videos that consist of red hot anger or any other extreme emotion, but it has to be negative. Positive emotions mysteriously don't provoke the same kind of engagement, but negative emotions do. And so anger, hate, fear, these are promoted by social media. And anyone, I mean, it doesn't take a great intellect to latch onto, to ride the wave. It doesn't take a, a huge intellect to do this. But when you do ride the wave, you appear to be an innovator, an intellectual, an amazing leader, a change agent, a transformer of life, a guru. And, and, and it's because you, you resonate with people, you reflect them. People love to be reflected. It's the mirror effect. They love to see themselves reified and embodied. And kind of, so when they see someone you know, like I mentioned Peterson or Trump, or, I mean, there are many others. When they see such people, they, they see themselves and they fall in love with themselves. That's the narcissistic hall of mirrors effect. But why are these personalities so popular? I think because they interact with their fans. They're very patient. They answer questions. They, you know, they are in constant touch. And because they take sides, they take sides. They identify with one camp to the exclusion of all other camps. They, they, it's identity politics. It's exclusionary. Now, there's no question that Jordan Peterson, for example, is not alt-right. I don't think he is at all. I think he's closer to the liberal tradition in the 19th century, Brit 19th century Britain. But he is definitely anti-left. So that puts him firmly in a camp. So now he has a camp. This camp is ready-made, just ready for the picking. And so he becomes an instant hit, an instant guru. As for me, you, you ask me why, why I'm not um, a lot more popular. Well, it's because I refuse to waste my time on socializing with people. I regard it as an utter waste of time. I don't chat. I don't respond to questions. I don't engage with comments. I don't make myself available in any way. People are an utter waste of time. I can glean whatever I need from studies, from reading comments, from monitoring interactions, and so on and so forth. I don't need to dedicate my scarce and precious resources to, to other people. I hold the vast majority of people in, in absolute contempt. And the worst part is they deserve it. And so I also don't belong anywhere, because to belong, you need to be with people. I renounce all affiliations, all labels. I'm an equal opportunity truth teller. I defy classification. And this elitism, elitism and impervious impartiality, they render me extremely hated and shunned. And you could say, as you had, as you had um, hinted <laughs> in a civil way before, you could say that this is psychopathic defiance. Yes, absolutely. You have, you have a point. 
it probably does derive or emanate from my uh, personality or conflation of personality disorders, from my psychological profile. But that's a truism. Every, everything, I mean, everyone is influenced by their psychological profiles when they make choices and adopt behaviors or, or something. So, but yeah, in my case, defiance is a, is a crucial factor. I, I agree fully, yeah. No, it, it wasn't, it wasn't my narcissism. It was my defiance, my, my psychopathic defiance. It's my way or the highway. The, the rules don't apply to me. I'm above it all, holding everyone in contempt. I don't need anyone. I'm self-sufficient, self-contained. I, I came to realize about a year ago that this kind of defiance is a form of self-defeat or self-destruction. It's, um, it's reckless. It's also stupid, but it's reckless. And now we see it on a global scale, you know, the anti-vaxxers defying the authorities, contumacious, fighting for freedom and liberty in their infinite idiocy. We see, you know, a similar phenomena all over the world. This psychopathic defiance came to define the modern ethos. It's the zeitgeist. It's the individual against the system and the establishment and the elites. And, you know, it's stupid. It's stupid because you end up paying the price. The system is constructed by individuals. And very often it's constructed for individuals. And it's going to defeat you. It's going to run you down. It's going to destroy you. And when you're 61, my age, you're going to look back and you're going to realize what an idiot you have been. You know, I was, I was trotting around and said, I don't need women. I'm above that. I'm superior. I don't have these beastly drives and urges. I don't need sex. I don't need, I'm 61. And I've spent the vast majority of my life celibate and abstinent. How clever is this, I ask you? This is the, isn't this the epitome of wisdom? I was saying, I don't need people. I don't need fans. I don't need followers. I don't need subscribers. I don't need supporters. And so I ended up without. <laughs> I, I avoided friendships and, and friends because I don't need them. It's, it's this assertion of self-sufficiency. I don't need anyone. I'm not dependent on anyone. I'm my own universe. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. Empowerment. Empowerment via isolation. Empowerment via atomization. Being strong because you don't exist. <laughs> if you don't exist, you can't be harmed. You're not vulnerable if you're dead. Dead people are not vulnerable. So defiance is about dying. Because you cut yourself off other people, off the institutions and structures that other people operate within. And by cutting yourself, you sever your lifeline, your umbilical cord, and you die. There are many ways to die, of course. But this is one of the surest. Defiance leads to death. Defiance leads to suspended animation, to the end of, of, of everything productive, everything constructive, every hope, every contact, every connection, every human relationships, every shred of humanity, every spark of humanity, not the least inside yourself. Defiance is extinguishing your fire. And so people are very proud in this libertarian day and age when everyone is godlike and everyone is narcissistic and everyone knows everything and everyone is all powerful because they have a smartphone. And so, you know, in this day and age, everyone is defined one way or another. Everyone is idiosyncratic. Everyone is special and unique. And everyone end up sacrificing their lives, sacrificing love 
sacrificing life, sacrificing connectivity, relatability, sacrificing everything that's meaningful in human life, just because they are signaling, virtue signaling, self-sufficiency signaling, invulnerability signaling, I'm not vulnerable, you can't do anything to me, you can't hurt me. This is fear. Defiance is object anxiety, it's fear. <laughs> Defiance is cowardice, it's craven. It shows you are terrified. Anti-vaxxers are terrified of vaccines. They're cowards, they're simply cowards. <laughs> And, and the same goes for all the other libertarian, freedom-loving convoys and movements, and I don't know what. They are, they are chickens. They're cowards. They're terrified of what life throws at them. They are risk-averse to the point of being life-averse. And I used to be like that. I avoided love. I avoided sex. I avoided relationships. You know, I've been a professor for 15 years. 15, yeah, one five, people don't know that. I've been a professor for 15 years. And I let people trash me, trash me counterfactually and claim that my PhD is fake, I'm not a professor, and so I let them because I said, who cares? I don't care about, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what other people say. I hold them in contempt. They are subhuman. <laughs> they are eat to shit machines. I mean, who cares what these passing transient phenomena say or don't say. Well, <laughs> a year ago I woke up. It was a year ago only that I made, made um, public the fact that I'm a professor in several universities, one of them among the most prestigious in the world. It's the outreach program of all the Ivy League universities in the world. So it took me 14 years because for 14 years I've been saying, I don't need people. I don't care what they think. They can think what, they can, they can go to hell. They can think whatever they want, you know. And look at the price I've paid in terms of reputation, in terms of standing, in terms of daily bombardment with hundreds of disparaging, demeaning, humiliating messaging, messages, death threats, I mean, you name it. Um, I said, you know, I I don't need women. I don't need, I'm above all that. What, what are women? I don't need women. Women think I need them. They think they have power over me. I'm going to show them they have no power over me. I'm stronger. And so I was left all by myself, you know. And I ended up not having sex. I'm 61. So... Who is the idiot? Who's the fool at the end of this of this game? Who? The defiant person. He is the fool. He is the fool in the card, in the in the card deck. But he considers himself superior. It's a form of grandiosity. Defines a form of grandiosity. Considers himself superior. He considers himself um, oblivious to human needs and and not subject to the constraints and restraints that affect other lesser, lesser mortals, the great unwashed, the hoi polloi, the plebeians. He is above it all. And so he's floating so high in space that, you know, no one can get him back. No one can get the defined person back. And he just vanishes into the stratosphere until he bursts, explodes. His internal pressure explodes him. And so I'm warning not only against narcissism, I'm warning about the current trends of defiance and self-sufficiency. They're going to bring all of us down one by one and all together. And it wasn't limited to my private life. Every job I had, every job I ever held, I conflicted with people. I was defiant. I told them to F off. I, it was my way, or again, the highway. And finally, it was the highway for me, never my way. You can't fight off collectives, institutions, groups who basically function reasonably well. So I kept losing jobs. My resume is like 
20 pages long because I kept changing jobs every few months because no one would tolerate me. No one wanted to work with me. I was annoying. I was overbearing. I was pompous. I was defiant. I, I, I refused. I was not a team worker. I refused to work with other people. I refused to collaborate. I refused to be there. I refused to deliver. I, 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 I thought of myself as the source of all authority and rules. I was a rule maker. I made the rules and they were my rules and they applied only to me. And, and so no one tolerated this. The world is not built to accommodate defiance because defiance ultimately is destructive to oneself and to others. And it's all, the world is all about progress, construction, building, more, never less. Defiance is about less, never more. And so people don't tolerate this, not in, in families and not in workplaces and not in governments and not among friends and not, no one tolerates um, a defined person. Ultimately, he ends up all alone, homeless or living in a car or something. And even if he's, he ends up being rich and famous and powerful and, and what have you, he doesn't have a real friend. He doesn't have anyone who truly loves him or cares for him. It's all self-interested. Defiance guarantees, defiance guarantees true isolation. It guarantees seclusion, solitude, which is extreme, both externally and internally. Defiance is about renouncing reality, except internal reality. Defiance is about withdrawing into oneself by rejecting life. It's, as, as uh, Jeffrey Zachs called it, it's a life unlived. Collectively called it rejecting life. It's about rejecting life. It's about saying no to life. Because life is mediated through the agency of other people. Institutions channel life. Um, everything, everyone and, and everything is a conduit for life. You can't touch life, immerse in life, integrate with life by being defined by rejecting all the agents of life. This life is brought to you by agents. Some of these agents are, are reprehensible, I fully agree. But a blanket policy of rejecting these agents is a blanket policy of rejecting life itself. 